And Lord, I just pray it now, the prayer we always pray. We are so thankful, Father, that you sent Jesus, your one and only son, to come to die for our sins, to give. And Jesus, you did. You came and you took our sin upon yourself. It became our sin. You went to the cross. Lord, you gave your blood and your body to take the wrath, to pay the price for our sin. We're so thankful that you died for our sins. And then you, you rose from the dead and walked out of that grave on the third day. You, you rose from the dead and walked out of the grave on the third day, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives. What a blessing in making us yours, born again, children of our loving, loving Father God in heaven. And now you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us, and we need you today to give us the power we need to to serve you and love you, that your Holy Spirit, your spirit, the, the fruit of your spirit would come through us. Lord, we know that we're not worthy, but you are worthy, and we give all the praise and glory and honor to you today. So lead us today in this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're going to tackle a subject. Uh, well, let me just do a little quick review. That'll be helpful. We've been on a series where we've been talking about the faith fight, the faith fight. If you are in Christ, Okay. In other words, if you're in Christ, that means the Holy Spirit dwells within you. There's a choice that you make constantly, all day long, every day. Not just one choice, but every day you make this choice. And it's whether you live by the flesh or live by the Spirit. Because now, now there is the Spirit in you there available for you. And at the same time, the flesh is in there pulling you every day, all the time, pulling you one direction. Now, the evil one can't come in and possess you because what? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In other words, you belong to Christ, right? But he can set up all the circumstances around you, which he does because he's in control of the, of the world system. And he can then what? Bring these temptations to you, right? To you and I. And what is the temptation? Because in us, we have evil. We have sin still in us. That, that sin desire is there. And we want to go out and grab this and grab that and take a little bit of this. Oh, I'll just taste that. I'll just do a little bit, okay? But the reality is that you and I have to make these choices, right? In, Rome, in Romans 8, it says if you choose to live by the flesh, it's going to do what is it's producing death. It'll produce death in your life. It'll produce, you know, literally it could produce physical death right away. It could just do that. It's some Christians that talks in the Bible that they decided, and they just were out there testing, and they were living by the flesh so much that God said, hey, we're out of here. And then there's various levels of things that you and I would experience based on that, what? Living by the flesh. And it says, live by the Spirit, and what do you get? Life. And that means life, all that God wants for you. That's where we get our passage. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Everybody said, I heard a big, big thing about what's God's will for you. It was a big, um, just a whole bunch of preaching and teaching about God's will. And I never heard it, it. The biggest thing to remember is to rejoice always and pray continually and give thanks. And that's in all circumstances. And that this is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. So the point is this. There is the will of God clearly stated in the word of God. In other words, what is the will of God? That's what the will of God is. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Then we go to uh, Hebrews 12. Uh, verse 2, it talks about this. One and two says, one says that we, because of what Jesus has done for us and the joy of this eternal salvation that we know that we have, right? The first 11 chapters of Romans explains that. What are we supposed to do? We, we are to give of ourselves, what I did just say, live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, okay? We're to be living sacrifices. In other words, give up stuff. In other words, give up things that you normally would do that you want to do, you give them up for Jesus. That's what it means, okay? Then you go to verse 2. It says, take on the mind of Christ. Take on the mind of Christ. That means to start thinking the way Jesus thought and the way Jesus thinks. And when he was here and what he taught us and all the things you learned from Jesus, take on the mind of Christ. Why? Why do you take on the mind of Christ? Now, this is important because today we're going to talk about this. And a secret to what we're talking about today is this statement. Why are we taking on the mind of Christ? so that we can know God's good and perfect will for our life today. That means each of the decisions you make and how you think and what you say and how you live your life today. Take on the mind of Christ, okay? And the next statement says, right after you do that, I love this because the Lord knows how we think. So here we are, we give up ourselves, we take on the mind of Christ, and we begin to live in this world 
where God wants us to live in a certain way that he wants us to live. And then, boom, God says to us, and don't think more highly of yourself than you should. <laughs> because the next thing we do, what? And think, well, hey, I got that. I'm working. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing Christian pretty good today. Huh? And he says, don't, don't go there. Don't go there. Just don't go there. Because every day is all in all humility is by the grace of God, right? Every day. That's why we rejoice. Because even if we're getting blown away and the truck just ran over us and then we got the wrong news at the doctor, we can rejoice. Why? Because we know Jesus overcame the world. We know that John 16, 33 says what? That you're going to have lots of trouble. It not, it's that. He says tribulations and problems. But don't worry. I've overcome the world. And that is why we can rejoice. Now, Everything I talked about today, everything I've just talked about today, and everything I've talked about for the last 38 or 49, whatever, 39 years in this room comes down to one thing. You either believe that God exists, or you do not believe that God exists. And if you believe that God exists, and you understand and you begin to learn as, he, as you seek God, he promises, what is God's promise? If you will seek me, I'll find you, you will find me. In other words, if you seek God, He'll be there. He's never going to let anybody down who's seeking God. And the beauty of it is, as, he seek, as we seek God, we get, to, we get to know Jesus. We begin to understand what's going on. And then we have this conflict, as I started out, where the confusion, the conflict. Here's the world we live in, and all the chaos, and all the circumstances of each of our lives, okay? And why did this happen to me, Lord? Why would you let that go? Why is this happening to this person? Why is my relationship not right? Why is this? Why is that? Why is that? We're constantly, you know, if you really are honest, it's why God? Why? Why can't we just do it this way? Why can't this, this work out? Lord, it just seems like it's so unfair. How about that? You ever heard that one? It seems so unfair. Look at these people over there. You read the Psalms. It continually talks about that. How they're looking at all these godless people and they're doing so well. They're doing so well. And look at us, we're over here trying to serve you and love you, and we're not doing so well. And, and, and the psalmist says, why? Why? And then the psalmist finally comes back to that, where we are. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for that's God's will. And you look at the psalms, they'll go through that process of thinking, and they always come back to where? Rejoicing, thanking God, right? For who he is, for what he's doing in their lives. Now, this all comes down to the basic concepts that I'm going to talk about right now. And that is that the Lord God Almighty, the Lord God Almighty is truly there and he is truly sovereign. Let me say it again. The God is who he says he is. The Lord God Almighty. Notice that the Lord God Almighty. And when I say the Lord God Almighty, because the Lord is who? Who's the Lord? Jesus Christ. The Lord God is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord God Almighty, he is the one who is sovereign in all things. Throughout the Bible, it teaches us he is sovereign. He's working all the time. Romans 8, 28, everybody likes to quote it, but it's subject only to those who love God. Are you with me? All things work together for good for those who what? Who love God. And 31 says, you know, why would he not give us all things? If he gave us Jesus, why would he not give us all things in Romans, what? 831. And then 832, I love it. If God's for you, who could be against you? Now, a bunch of people can be against you, but they, they can't do a thing that doesn't come through the loving hands of the sovereignty of God. Now, sovereignty is, is it's, nobody, we can't understand it. It's, it's beyond us, but we can we can go and look at what the Bible tells us, and we can we can go around it, and we can enjoy, or, or we can embrace it, is a better word. We can embrace the sovereignty of God. And it is a scary thing to do. It's extremely, it's on the edge of this, what we call the faith fight. Are you with me? The faith fight? That's where we've been working, right, guys? And where did we come at the end of our last series of, no, the faith fight five? We were talking about four and five, about following instructions. Following instructions. The Bible gives you instruction. Blessed is the man who does what? Not walk in the council of wicked or sit in the seat of sinners. But his delight is on what? On the word of God. So he reads the word of God. He follows instructions. Psalm 119, the entire psalm 
talks about how the word of God is a light unto your path. Here's the point. Follow instructions. Read the word of God. Eat it and drink. What Jesus say? Man does not live on what? Bread alone, but on the word of God. And every day we eat and drink the word of God. We eat and drink it. And here's where we come to. Why? Now, Jesus talked about this all the time. And that's how Jesus lived his life all the time. Always knowing that the Father is there and that he and the Father are one, one, and that all the stuff that was happening to Jesus, Jesus knew was all put in place and within what? The sovereignty of who? Of the Father. The Father knew, had it all dialed in, and put it together. It says in the Bible, it says further that um, God's ways are greater than our ways. We'll never, we don't, you know, we can't get there. Someday, when we're in heaven, get there, it'll all be laid out before us. But right now, how do we live by now? What do we live by now? What's Paul say? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says what? We live by what? By faith, not by sight, but by faith. Why is that so important? Because the definition of faith is what? Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Unseen. So what is it that's unseen, guys? I mean, just think about what is it that's unseen? It's the sovereignty and the working of God in the middle of this mess. Do you understand? It's this entire mess, whether it's the political, financial, you know, the, the military, you know, actions that are going on, just everything. It's the sovereignty of God working in all of these things all the time for God's good and perfect will in Christ Jesus. Is for you to give thanks. Because see, the key, now if you go back to Romans chapter 1, it talks about the key for all humanity. The one thing that God was looking for, most importantly, is what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And you do not give Thanksgiving unless you do. You have to have somebody to give thanks to, right? And that means you believe that God exists. And if you believe that he exists, the concept, now listen, this is important. The concept of the fear of the Lord is that not only does he exist, but he's all powerful and we're responsible to our creator. Okay. And that's what the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom and understanding. The Bible says that. And then it says further, what all wisdom and understanding comes who? through who in and through who Jesus Christ. Right? So here we go. So pick up the notes. If you look at this with me, I want you to think about this. We're going to talk about the title is of our message is the Lord God almighty. Okay. The Lord God almighty. Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. Notice I didn't say and, because see, it's not like that. It's not like this and this and this. God is in three persons. Father, Jesus Christ, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. The Father and all the attributes of the Father are found in who? In Jesus Christ. Do you understand? And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that means Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, are together the Lord God Almighty. So let's read this. This is John 11, 25. Oh, it should say 26. It says 56. That's some typo. So it's 25 and 26. And this, I was just uh, praying with Tom, and, and he's in the last stages and suffering the cancer. And he used to be part of our group, as you know. And he would have been today at the lunch with us. And, and Tom and I are praying the first thing out of his mouth, because we've been you know, praying about this, is a, what? Life to life. Life to life. What are you? What? He says, this is what I'm focusing on, is life to life. And what does this mean? He says this, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though he die. Now listen to me. The one who believes in me will live, even though he die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is it. Do you believe this? I was talking to Bruce, right? We talked to your buddy. And, and one of the things he teaches, and then I, I knew him when he was a young guy, just, you know, coming up through the, 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 the program. And here he is, an example of what it means for someone to trust God, knowing that even though you die, you live. So you can, what can you do now? Now I can fight the battle. I can go ahead and fight the battle. They, a, a battle they said he was going to lose a long time ago. You can keep fighting the battle. Why? Because I belong to Christ. 
My downside is my upside. I go from life to life. And the life that I'm going to is not confusing. The life I go to is not out of control. The life I go to is a life with Christ eternal. Now let's go on and read the next one. This is Revelation 1.8. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. God. Now look, look at what it says here. It says the who? Who? Lord God. Lord God. Now who's that? That's Jesus Christ. He is the Lord God. Then it says, who is, who was, and who is to come. And what does it say now? Almighty. This is really important. There's other other gods and people have other religions. But Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty. Do you hear this? The Lord God Almighty, the one who was, is, will come. Now listen to what this Revelation 1.17 says this. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Now listen carefully. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. The death and Hades. This is, this is our Lord, our God, and our Savior. He's the one who keeps us from going to what? To the second death, the lake of fire. Because he, he takes care of our sin. And, and this is so exciting. I, I, we're talking to Bobby uh, Taylor because he lives up there where the fires are. Those are real fires, guys. And, and Bob was saying to me, Don, it's like different. I mean, you know, you know the fires, you look at the snow. But when you're looking there in the flames, you can look out your window and you can see the flames. It's different. There's a different attitude, a different feeling that you have about your home and about your life and all the things that are going on. And that's what the fear of the Lord is. If you, if you don't ever see the flames, if you don't ever understand the, the massive destruction and e that will come, the fear of the Lord without that, you don't understand the good news. You, you don't appreciate the good news. And when you talk, I'm talking to Tim, uh, Tom Babber, well, he appreciates the good news. You know, he, he could see the flames, but he can appreciate the good news that he'll never see. Those flames will never touch him. Okay? This, this death, this death that's coming upon all of us, but certain people are, are looking at right in the eye right now, they don't have to be afraid of that death because they'll never see that death away from me. Away from me, evil one. Away from me. Because that will never touch us because we belong to Christ. Now look at what it says here. Jesus said. I love this. Um, Revelation uh, 2, 18b says this. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. In other words, this is Jesus. He is the risen one and he's for real. And he's talking to the churches. This is in the first three chapters of Revelation where he's saying, hey, guys, get your act together. That's what he's talking to you and me about. Um, you know, Wayne and I were talking about that when he was talking about me. You know, you're a pretty obnoxious guy, Don. You got to get your act together here if you want to, you know, talking about the guys or whatever. And I said, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. Because I didn't, you know, don't want to have that, you know, overbearing judgmental attitude. I, you know, but my mind is so dialed in. You know what I mean? To what's going on. And, and I've been struggling on this, that, and the other thing. And so if I'm having difficulty uh, trying to make a living, make a deal, or I'm trying to figure out how to play golf, but I can't walk, or my back, you know, back then the back stuff, you know, you get yourself going. What happens? You forget that Jesus Christ, he's everything. And you're basically nothing. In other words, this is so cool. The less you, the more Jesus. Let's just think about that. I keep if the more that I'm nothing, the more he's everything. That's the key to everything. That's how you deal. Nancy and I were struggling because we're trying to financially do some things and, and we had some, and finally made a deal or whatever. And I, I want to be a joyful giver, right? I want to be a joyful giver right off the top and talks about it. But here I am thinking, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about taxes? What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do that? I said, what are you doing? Who, who are you thinking about? What are you thinking? Where did it come from in the first place? What's it all about? Then I read the passages about how the Lord gives us the seed and then the seed goes out and plants and then he's the one who provides. And, you know, do you need to trust him so that we can be joy, you know, joyful, praying. And we prayed 
and and I'm so thankful for you know Nancy and I together and and I just think about what it means to to be able to participate in the divine nature of God. Did you know? And you guys, this is a secret passage. I I don't give this one out much. This is one I keep in my back pocket, but I'll I'll tell you guys just as a paper. Okay, just no charge for this. One. So Second Peter chapter one. Okay, Second Peter chapter one. Listen to this. It says this. I got another secret one I'll give you in a minute, but remind me. Anyway, this is so cool. It says that through Jesus Christ and all the promises of Christ, we've get we've been getting everything we need to participate. Listen, to participate in the divine nature of God. Isn't that cool? We can participate in the divine nature of God when we're focused on Christ. Isn't that awesome? And for me, that's awesome because it takes me from being nobody to helping me be somebody to help to love somebody and take from there. So let's go to the next one. John 1, 1 through 5 and 14, it says this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. In him was life. And, th and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. That's where we are now, chaos and darkness in our world. And the darkness has not overcome it. The word, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Isn't that wonderful? And Hebrews 1, 3 says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And Colossians 1, 15 through 20 tells this about Jesus. The sun is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is above all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross and hebrews 4 14 through 16 says this therefore since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven jesus the son of god let us hold firmly to the faith we profess let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Now, verse 16 is one of my favorite verses. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Now, this is the key where we are today. We're, we're in the faith fight. You know what confidence means? Confidence is where definition rubber meets the road. In other words, we come through faith and confidence, so that we may receive what? Mercy. We don't want to get what we deserve. This means we admit that we deserve to be destroyed. We admit that we deserve to be punished. And I'm asking you, Lord, have mercy upon me. I do this. I'm constantly at the throne of mercy and grace. I am so thankful it says mercy. Why do you think it says mercy before it says grace? Because if you don't get the mercy, there won't be anybody left to get the grace. The unmerited favors, you've already been crispy crittered and you're gone. The mercy we need now today is the mercy of God upon us so that we can do what? So that we can get the grace. Look at what it says here. I love this. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It, listen, guys, I, if you one thing about the Bible and you read it, you study it, and you may go in there, you figure out, hey, I am in need. I didn't realize it, but I, I have a lot of needs. A lot of people avoid going to Bible study because they don't want to hear what the Word of God says because it'll penetrate into their life and it'll tell them where they really stand. And they don't want to know that. They don't want to go to Bible study. That's why it's important for you guys to invite as many guys as you can to the luncheon today because 
The luncheon is a place where guys will come and won't go to church, they won't go to Bible study, but they'll come to a quick lunch, they'll come to a business thing, it's all business related, what the Word of God says, and they think, maybe I'll get some stuff, and it'll help me make more money, you know, whatever their motivation is, when they come, they get Jesus, okay, because that's what they need, that's what your business needs, your business needs more of Jesus, okay, so let's go on a little bit further, it says it, turn it over, this is exciting, we got a couple minutes, and I want to focus on this. Okay, now we're going to talk about, we just talked about Jesus. Did, did anybody miss it that we were talking about Jesus? Did we? Did you not get that? Those verses, I want you to take those home. I want you to teach them to your wife, your kids, grandkids. I, they need to know who Jesus is. Because one of the things we do, I know we have lots of wonderful services and churches and all the stuff and Bible studies and everything. But you know what we need to do? We need to know who Jesus is. And this, those passages I gave you are, are, are really good passages for understanding who Jesus is. I have a lot of Christians and guys I've known for years that have been Christians that don't, they don't know what we just studied. They don't know that information. They can't find it if they did, if they wanted to find it to show it to somebody. Do you understand? And you need to make sure that you know it. All out those wonderful songs that you, you know, send out, Kirk, they're wonderful, but they don't mean nothing if you don't know Jesus. And they don't mean a thing if the guy who wrote them wrote a great song and a great music and everything. And you ask him, who, and he he can't even figure out where they are because he did you know he, he only knows a certain part of Jesus, right? You need to know who Jesus is because this is the key. Listen to me. Without you knowing who Jesus is, you cannot believe and understand and comprehend in any form the sovereignty of God and everything about the faith fight. Now listen carefully. Everything about the faith fight, and remember the faith fight, it's between hope and dread. You understand? It's between hope and dread. Hope is something good's going to happen in the future, and dread is something bad's going to happen in the future. You understand that? Every single human that lives is constantly thinking about the difference between hope and dread. And when dread takes over, there's no hope. Do you understand? Because dread continually believes that something bad's going to happen in the future, and if you go far enough into dread, what do you get? Depression. You go far enough into depression, what do you get? Death. You understand? They get far enough into depression, what do they want to do? Kill themselves. Why? Because they have no hope. And without hope, what, David? Without hope, there is no hope, right? And that hope comes from Christ in Christ alone. That's why it's so important that we understand who Jesus is. That's why we understand life to life. That's why we understand that Jesus said we're going to have problems and tribulations. But don't worry, I've overcome those. So that we can listen to God and say, okay, God, these people, they meant it for evil. Like Joseph said to his brothers, remember? In uh, Genesis 43, I think it is, he said, they meant it for evil, but God used it for good, right? All the evil that's out there that's going on, God can use it for whatever he wants to use it for. And he uses it for good in the lives of those who what? Who trust him, who believe in faith and walk by faith every day. And when you walk by faith, you don't walk by sight. You walk by faith. You walk by what God hope that something good is going to happen in the future. And you look at dread. Oh, you identify dread. You can't help it. It's biting you, running after you. You look at dread and you say, okay, you're there. You're real. But Jesus has overcome you through his death and his resurrection and I have decided to believe by hope that God is working in this mess. And that's called sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. Not only do I believe that God's working in this thing that's going on around me, this mess, but I believe he's working for me for good because I believe what he said in Romans 8, 28. And that means that I fear the Lord and I don't fear the world. Uh, I think it's Isaiah 13 or 14. It talks about do not think like everyone else does. Now, it was very important. He says, don't think like everyone else. Did. Some conspiracy behind closed doors is going to be the indie. Remember that God is the God Almighty, and he's the one who's holy. And you trust God. You don't look at everything else. Okay? So let's read this now. We're going to close with this. We're going to be talking about this for a long time. So let's just get it this time, and you can take it home and think about it. What is the vertical truth? The vertical truth is what God, through his word, has taken like lightning and brought into the world. And that's the word of God. 
And the word of God is all about who? Who did we learn that in John, the first chapter of John? It's all about Jesus Christ. All right. So now we're going to go through. Now, this is my personal Bible study notes. Okay. This isn't from somebody else. This isn't, I'm not selling this. I'm just telling you, this is what I've learned after studying the Bible. And I put it down here and I want to share it with you. Okay. So let's go through it together. And I think God will really help you grow in your faith and able to trust him in the, his sovereignty in your life. Okay. Vertical truth. The great, all-powerful I am, in quotes, the only true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one God in three persons, the God of the Bible, in quotes, exists from eternity past to eternity future. So let's just read these together. Here we go. God is holy and righteous in all his being and purposes. God created all things. Everything that exists was created by God. God sustains and maintains everything, always. God holds all things together, everything. God is in all things, all things are in God. God is in the midst of all that happens. God is sovereign in all things, always. God is everywhere at all times, past, present, and future. God is working through and in all things, every situation and circumstance. God knows everything that will ever happen in advance from eternity past. God knows in advance every thought, word, and action of every created being. God is never surprised and is working in all things always. God is all-powerful. No person can stand against his good and perfect will. God is more than we can understand. God's ways are greater than our ways. God's thoughts are beyond comprehension without the aid of the Holy Spirit. God blesses those who fear him by trusting in his promises by faith. God loves sinners. God's love is made real by his mercy and grace in Christ. God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. God is to be glorified, worshipped, thanked, and obeyed by all creation. God becomes our loving Father when we repent and believe on and in Jesus Christ. God, as the Son, Jesus Christ, died for our sins on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day to defeat the power of sin and death in our lives, making us born again children of the loving Father. Our name is written in the book of life for eternity. And Lord, we thank you now. You truly have come. You died. You rose from the dead. You've written our names in the book of life. You're with us. You've given us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. And we pray that today these words will touch these men's hearts and all who hear this, that they will turn to you and love you, they'll walk by faith and not by sight, and that you will work in their lives through your sovereignty to bless each one of them. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord.